Okay, we're being recorded. We're back to share screen. <clears throat> hmm. Looks like I cannot save my iPad. Damn it. Okay, so this one will just be recorded in Zoom. Um, okay, so today we're going to discuss um, exchange for uh, symmetrization of the many body wave function. Symmetrization of the many body wave function and <clears throat> exchange forces. Exchange forces. Um, that's the plan for today. And then it will lead us to a discussion of eventually um, addition of spin. That's where we're going after this. Addition of spin. <clears throat> okay, so that's the that's this that's the plan for today. Um, sorry, I gotta keep moving with this thing up. Um, so um, okay, so last time we talked about um, we talked about fermions and bosons, and we were talking about how to uh, um, uh, symmetrize the many body wave function. So if we have a bunch of particles, let's say I have these states, particle in the box states, and I throw some particles into here, and the particles, I throw them into this box, then um, how do I make, <clears throat> then how do I make a um, many body wave function? Um, and so then we saw that um, the many body wave function must be anti-symmetric uh, for fermions, where the, that means spin is a half integer. And it must be symmetric for bosons, where s equals an integer. And so that means then that the um, the um, uh, eigenvalue of the particle exchange operator. is going to be minus one for um, fermions and it's going to be plus one for bosons. <clears throat> but then the question is how do we construct those wave functions that have that that weird property that when I exchange particles uh, the wave function goes to the negative in the one case or goes to the positive in the other case and we talked about uh, the Slater determinant. So that's the big trick that I discussed in the last lecture later determinant. Oh, and by the way, um, you know, this is the first live lecture we're having. So I guess if you have some, you know, something is really unclear that I'm saying, then go ahead. I guess you just have to uh, sort of shout out because I'm not looking for like the hands being raised on the computer screen because I'm focused on this uh, iPad thing. So uh, go ahead and, uh, you know, shout out if there's some clarification that you need. <clears throat> okay, so the Slater determinant Though um, we can, so this allows us to construct the many body wave function uh, of many particles, x1, x2, all the way to n particles, and it has some uh, normalization factor. And there's some complicated formula for the normalization factor, not that complicated, but I'm not, it's different depending on whether you have fermions or bosons. But the important thing is to be able to construct this determinant where the rows. Uh, list all of the uh, states, psi a, x1, a, x2, psi a, xn, uh, and then 
we have the next state, psi b, x1, psi b, x2, psi b, xn, and all the way to the last state, which is psi c, x1, uh, psi c, x2, psi c, xn. And, and that's the wave function. Uh, you make that uh, determinant, you do that determinant. <clears throat> and if you've never seen this before, I think it looks kind of confusing and complicated, but it's actually not. There's something really simple here, although it's hard to see the simplicity when you've only seen it for the first time. The simplicity is that if I, I have n particles, and what I'm doing is I'm just throwing them into n states. And this, the particles are indexed by this x1, x2, x3, et cetera. But the states are psi a, psi b, et cetera, to some final state, psi c. And so you just think, and, and so you're just taking the single particle states, and I'm just throwing the electrons for the particles into the single particle states. And every electron has to go into some single particle state. That's sort of the algorithm. And I just, and then I construct th this matrix, this Slater determinant from those single particle states. So you can pick whatever states you want. If I have uh, five particles, I can pick five states. If there depends on, if they're fermions, I have to pick five different states. If they're bosons, I could pick two states because bosons can be in the same state. Whatever, you, whatever kind of particle, you just throw this, you just construct this determinant. And you, you the state, uh, uh, the rows, the, the the row index indicates the states, and the column index indicates the the particles. Okay, so I guess I won't belabor it more, but it, I just it, it, even if it doesn't make sense to you now, you should know that there is a simplicity to it, and you can talk to me or Newton more to, to understand that. Okay, so last time we 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 talked about that and we constructed. Um, last time, what we did was we constructed the many-body wave function for two particles. And we constructed it explicitly using this later determinant for the two particles. And we did it for fermions and for bosons. And so, <clears throat> Um, and so today, what I want to do is 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 um, uh, is is discuss what what are the consequences of that. And so let's let's so so today we want to understand what are the consequences of this weird wave function. Consequences of the weird wave function. And so let's talk about. Uh, so let, let's so let's set the problem up today. So today, I have a box, and um, I'm going to put my particles in this box. And I'm just going to keep drawing the same thing. We'll call this the state A, and you can think of that as the ground state. And this is state B. That's like the first excited state of the box. State C. So I have all these states, and so I'm going to take two particles. Two particles. And I'm going to throw them into state A and state B. And I'm going to construct the many, the, uh, all the different possible many body wave functions. And we're going to look to see what is the consequences of these different types of wave functions. So there's going to be three, three cases. The first case, one, is when I have. Um, the first case is when I have, um, when the particles are not identical, particles not identical. And when I, when the particles are not identical, that means like, like, let's say one particle is an electron and one particle is a proton or, or one particle is a, a muon and the other particle is an electron. When they're not identical, then there's no symmetrization requirement. All that symmetrization stuff we've been just talking about goes uh, out the window. Okay, there's no symmetrization. <clears throat> there's no symmetrization requirement because all the there's 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 no 
if I exchange the particles, they're 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 different. So there's no there's no requirements. Uh, all the arguments we made last time do no longer apply. And so now um, I can I, I don't have to symmetrize the wave function. So now the wave function um, can be this psi many body of the two particles is very simple. I can just write it as um, a product state psi a of x1 and psi b of x2. So I'm just so there's no special so this has no special properties under this is not an eigenstate of the particle exchange uh, operator, not eigenstate of p12. And you can see that act on this, act that on this state, and you can see it does not come back to itself. <clears throat> but there's another possibility. Let's consider the other possibility. I have identical, the particles are identical, but they are fermions. And so now um, we have um, this other situation where now the many body state must be symmetrized, but it, but it also must be anti-symmetric. Anti-symmetric, which means that um, if I hit my wave function with this, psi so many body x1, x2, then it has to equal negative. It has to go to the negative of itself. That's what it means to be anti-symmetric. Okay, so um, how do we construct this the anti-symmetric many-body wave function for two particles? Well, we do the Slater determinant, and we did that last time for two particles. I'm not going to do it again, but when we do the Slater determinant, we see that the many-body wave function of the two particles it can be written as um, one over square root two. Um, uh, psi a of x1, psi b of x2, minus psi a of x2, psi b of x1. And so this is, so we got that from this later determinant. Uh, and, and so, and that fulfills the requirement. If I exchange the two, the labels on the two particles, this wave function goes to its negative. Okay. Um, and then we have, um, another okay, another situation, the third case, which is suppose that I have identical bosons. Then once again, I have to now I have to once again I have to symmetrize the wave function because they're all identical particles. Uh, so so that means that the wave function has to be, um, uh, an eigenstate under the exchange, uh, particle exchange operator, uh, but because they're bosons, then the many body wave function has to be symmetric under particle exchange, which means now that if I do this, if I, if I hit my many body wave function with the exchange operator, then it has to go to plus. So the question then is, uh, how do I get that wave function? Well, um, I know the trick because we talked about it last time. I, I set up that Slater determinant, but then I do a little trick, Slater determinant, but then I do the little trick. And the trick is that I, I changed all the minuses into pluses. And when I say minuses and pluses, I'm talking about all the minuses. When you, whenever you construct a determinant, you know there's all these minuses because you've all done it before. You know the 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 algorithm for making a determinant, and you just turn all the minuses into pluses. And that's the trick. Uh, and then what happens then for two particles is you're going to see that the the many body wave function <coughs> is going to be um, this. It's going to be one half because the normalization. Now it's slightly different, and it's going to be psi a of x1, psi b of x2. Um, let me make sure we got that. I can't remember if that's a square root of two or not. Well, let's put a square root of two. Um, psi a x1, psi b x2 plus 
psi A, X2, psi B, X1. Okay, so I just want you to see that these are three possibilities for two particles, and the wave function you see look very different depending on whether they are identi not identical or identical. And now the wave functions look very different, but I do want to point out that if we calculate the energy, um, the energy of all of these states, uh, then uh, all of these states are eigenstates of the, Hamil of the total Hamiltonian, which is H1 plus H2. And so if I hit all of these states with the total Hamiltonian, then I get the total energy. And I suggest that you guys do that on your own to figure out what the total energy is. But when you do that, you'll see that the total energy for all three of these different many body states is, um, well, can anyone guess what's the total energy? Someone shout it out. The sum of the individual. Exactly. Energy, it's, it's epsilon A plus epsilon B where those are just the energies. Let's go back to this, where this is just the energy of state A, the energy of state B, the energy of state C. The particle in a box energy, which you guys all derived last semester and you all, you all did that last, last year. Okay, right, so they all have the same energy. They all have the same energy. So all three of these wave functions have the same energy. And so you might be tempted to believe that all three of these wave functions uh, have exactly the same properties, that they lead to the same physical properties. But that would be wrong. Uh, these three wave functions uh, have uh, lead to some very different behavior. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and that behavior we call, uh, leads to what we call exchange forces. It's the, the uh, particles, sorry. yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Um, can you just briefly explain that differences in the coefficients of the Slater determinant between uh, bosons and fermions. I'm not understanding those extra terms in the bosons. Extra, you mean the normalization factor? The, the one normalization factor, is that what you mean? Yes, um, okay. there's like a one over n factorial yeah, yeah, squared yeah. n factorial. Right, 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 right. So it's for the fermions, it's easy, yeah? Because it's one over square root of n factorial. Simple, yeah? But then for the bosons, it's trickier because it's gonna be uh, one over the square root of n factorial times n a, n b, right? N c, um, and so, et cetera. And so the deal is, is if I construct my Slater determinant, um, if I have bosons, if I have fermions, all the states, have to be different, psi A, psi B, psi C. Let's say I have four particles, psi D. I need to pick four different states when I construct my Slater determinant for fermions. But if I have bosons, that requirement is gone. So that means for bosons, let's, let's do bosons. That means that two of these states, I could put two. So for this case that I have that done right here, I put, four particles, one in A, one in B, one in C, one in D, right? Here's my, here's my, this is psi A, psi B, psi C, psi D. And for this case, I just circled, I put one particle in A, one particle in B, one particle in C, one particle in D. But for bosons, I could put two particles in B. In fact, I could put three particles in B, check it out. I'm gonna do that. Boom. I'm going to change that and that and that. Okay, now I'm going to do this. Check it out. Now I'm going to put three particles in B. One, two, three, and one particle in A. That means my slater determinant has to look like this, B, B. So now I have one particle in A and three particles in B, and I can construct this slater determinant because it doesn't go to zero because I've changed all the minuses to pluses. And so now for this particular example right here, then my, then my normalization factor is going to be one times square root of n factorial, which is um, one, two, three, four. It's four factorial because there's four particles. Now n a factorial is the number of particles in state a, uh, which is one. 
Okay, one vector is one. Uh, and then the rest of them are B. B, and so B has three in there, so that'd be three factorial. And so that means that my normalization factor then is one over square root of four factorial times three factorial. Okay, is that, is that it? Does that makes sense? Yeah, I see now, thank you. Okay, actually, since we're doing it, we might as well get the, well, what is the normalization of the other one? Let's see, two. Oh, it's still one over square root of two. Okay, good, good, good. Okay, so, uh, okay, so that's an example. Um, now let's consider what are the differences due to the fact that we have these three situations. And uh, I want you to see, I want to talk about what are the, 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 the consequences of this symmetrization. And so the first thing we'll do, so what we're gonna do is we, is, um, we have to ask ourselves, how are we going to uh, see what, what, what does it mean uh, for there to be differences? And so <clears throat> what's gonna happen is the, the particles behave as though there are forces. There are, it's like a phantom force. And I call it a phantom force because these are non-interacting particles. There's no interaction, non-interacting. And so, there is no force between them. There's no actual force, and so you would think that there couldn't, there, there would, just, everything would just be the same. But what's going to happen is we're going to see that the particles behave differently for bosons, fermions, or distinguishable particle, distinguishable particles, as they're going to behave as though there's a force. Uh, and I'll just tell you the answer right now. The answer is that uh, if I look relative to the non-interacting case then what we're gonna see is that the fermions repel each other and the bosons attract each other. That's the answer. That's what we're about to derive. So I'm telling you the answer so that you can kind of try to see how we get to that answer. It's sometimes helpful to know the answer before you get the answer. Um, and so this is what we wanna derive right now. Why would fermions repel each other when there's actually no force between them? Why would bosons attract each other? It makes no sense. But it is one of these weird consequences of these symmetrized wave functions, many body wave functions. So it's really kind of kind of cool. And I will just tell you that it's very significant because the repulsion of fermions leads to a, um, for example, many phenomena, but one very famous one that you've all heard of is magnetism. All right. So the, re the repulsion of fermions leads to magnetism. You wouldn't have magnetism without that. Bosons attracting each other leads to Bose-Einstein condensation. You might have heard of that, Bose-Einstein condensation. So these are two consequences of this stuff. There's other consequences too. Okay, so how do we, how, how do we see this? Well, I think the simplest way to do it is, is to do basically what Griffiths does. It's a very famous example. And let's, let's do this. Let's calculate the average distance between the two particles. Calculate the distance between the two particles. Because remember, I'm talking about two particles. All right, it's a quantum mechanical situation. I basically remember the whole point is I have two particles in a box, particle one and particle two. That, that's what we're talking about. And so the question is, uh, what is the distance, distance between these two particles? Okay, it's a very simple, um, very simple question. What is the distance between them? Okay, so we can ask that question. It's a very uh, simple question to ask, but, uh, but as you know, of course, quantum mechanics makes everything weird and hard. <laughs> weird and hard. And so how do we answer this trivial question using quantum mechanics? Well, okay, because the thing is, it's like the particles don't really have well-defined positions and you know, quantum mechanics is so weird, but we can actually uh, answer this question very easily. What we're gonna do is we can just say, what is the, well, let's change it. So quantum mechanics is all about probability. So what we can do is we can say, what's the average distance between the two particles? That's what we can ask. And then you can say, okay, well, how does that, how do you answer that question? What's the average distance between the two particles? Well, what we do is we do the experiment. We construct an, construct an ensemble of systems, ensemble, 
which means that we, we, we put to the two particles, we prepare the situation uh, a billion times. Okay, it's one, and then we prepare it again, and then we prepare it again, and then we measure for each system, then we measure the distance between the two particles. Okay, so we, do, we prepare an ensemble of experiments and we measure the distance between the two particles. We prepare them identically and we measure them each time. And then we make a histogram of the, the number of, for a particular answer versus the, all the different possible distances. And we're gonna get some weird histogram of answers because we did the experiment a billion times. And then from this histogram, I can calculate the average using, then we can calculate the average using, using simple statistics like what you guys have all learned in the past. And that's, that's it. So we can have, so that then we call the, the average of x1 minus 2, okay? So that's how you answer that question in quantum mechanics. And that's something that you learned last semester. So that should be sort of a review for you. So when I say what's the distance between the particles, that has no meaning uh, unless we actually do uh, the experiment a gazillion times and do the measurement a gazillion times on an ensemble of systems all prepared identically. And then we average the answers that we get. And that is then the average distance between the two particles. Now that average distance, of course, has another name. We, we call it something else. In quantum mechanics, we have a special word for that. What is the word? Someone tell me. We call this the what? Expectation value. Exactly. We call it the expectation value, and we know how to add, how to calculate it. We call it the expectation value of the operator x1 minus x2, the distance between particle 1 and 2. And the way we calculate it, every, as you learned last semester, is we do the sandwich trick. So we have to pick a wave function, psi, the many-body wave function, and then we calculate it, psi many-body, x1, these are operators, minus x2. And then we calculate it. Okay, so we calculate the average distance between x1 minus x2. Um, now, um, okay, so so that's what we do, and then we find it. Okay, uh, that's it. But but the thing is, is that um, if I have two particles that are that are sort of bouncing around zero. The, the, if I calculate this expectation value, it's very inconvenient because everything will zero out. And so what we usually do just for convenience, for, for convenience, what we like to do is we like to calculate the expectation value of x1 minus x2 squared. And then what we can do is we can always just take the square root of it. And so that's the root mean square, RMS value. And the reason why we do RMS is, is just so uh, everything doesn't go to zero. Uh, because the thing is, like, I can have two particles bouncing around zero, and there could be an average distance between them. But if I just calculate the expectation value of x1 minus x2, then I'm going to get zero. But that won't really give us what we want. What we really want is the um, square root of the, of the uh, expectation value of x1 minus x2 squared. Uh, okay, so then let's calculate that for these three cases. And so let's calculate the expectation value. So for some many body wave function, so let's calculate this quantity, x, x1 minus x2. So I told you how we would do it experimentally. We would do the experiment a gazillion times, and, but then to, to, to measure the expectation value of this. But now I want to predict it using quantum mechanics. So let's predict what that value is. And so that's going to be, then the expectation value of, let's multiply it out, let's do a little math, x1 squared plus x2 squared minus x1, x2, the expectation value of that. I'm going to calculate this quantity, and then using the little trick of associative or distributive or one of those math properties, I can see that this thing is, is the expectation value of x1 squared plus the expectation value of x2 squared minus the expectation value of x1 times x2. Okay, so, so this is the thing that we want. We want to calculate this. 
And so we're going to calculate this for the three cases. So remember what they were. They were the distinguishable case, the uh, fermion case, and the bosons case. We're going to calculate this and we're going to see that they're all different. It, the, the, the values of x1 minus x2 squared, the expectation value, are going to be different for those three cases, uh, suggesting that there's for phantom forces causing it to be different. Phantom forces, which we like to call exchange forces, because they come about due to this property that uh, we have to symmetrize the wave function to satisfy the properties to make them into eigenstates of the exchange operator. So we call them exchange forces. Okay, so let's calculate this now. Um, so here we go. Uh, let's calculate, um, let's do case one, which is when the two particles are distinguishable. Um, and so now <clears throat> what we do is uh, we see that the, the wave function, the many body wave function, is equal to um, one particle. Particle one is living in state A and particle two is living in state B. So that's my wave function. Uh, and so now uh, to calculate uh, x1 minus x2 squared, I have to first calculate these three terms each separately. Okay. And then I have to add these two and then subtract this term. Okay, so this is what we're going to calculate. <coughs> So, so that, yeah. Should there be a factor of two before the last term? Yeah, there is. Sorry, I made a little mistake there. Two. Thanks. Um, good. Uh, okay, and so let's calculate these 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 terms. Uh, and so first, we'll calculate the expectation value of uh, basically the expectation value of x one squared, where that's the position of particle one. So we got to calculate that. And so that's, so then we have to <clears throat> do an integral. You guys know how to calculate expectation values. It's, it's going to be basically star, psi star uh, times the operator times psi, right? That's how you do it. But in this case, the wave function is a variable of x1 and x2. So we've got to integrate over those two variables. Um, and psi star is going to be psi a star of x1. Uh, psi b star of x2. So you just plug it in and then x1 squared and then psi, psi a of x1, psi b of x2. So you just do that. Uh, and then you look at this thing and you see that I can, I can rewrite that integral because if I separate it into um, an integral over x1, then I can have x1 squared here, psi a of x1, and then another integral over x2, where that's going to be psi b of x2, psi b of x2, star. And so then you look at this and the integral, whoops, this integral um, is equal to what? Someone tell me what that integral is equal to. One. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and then this integral, you'll notice, is just, you see that this subscript one is really a dummy subscript. Because what, I've, what this is, this is giving me, uh, r remember what we're talking about. We're talking about these states of the box. I have state A and I have state B. Uh, and so, um, one particle's here, one particle's here. And these, these are wave functions. These are single particle wave functions, right? And so basically this is giving me the expectation value, whoops. Um, so this thing is giving me the expectation value of the X operator for state A, which is just equal to psi A X psi A. So, so that's what this, so that's what this integral is giving me. And so we can see then that x1 squared 
is equal to the expectation value of the position operator in state A. Okay, so we did it. Yay. Um, and so now we will similarly, now we will do the same algebra for uh, um, x2 squared. And when we do it, I'm not going to go through the algebra because it's the same algebra, but you can imagine what we're going to get because x2 is lived, that the particle 2 is living in state B here. And so then you can see then that this is going to be the expectation value. Oh, I'm sorry, this is x squared. Uh, wait, uh, yeah, sorry. Algebra mistakes. And so this then is going to be the expectation value of the x squared operator for state B. Okay, good. And now we just have to do the next thing, which is to find the expectation value of x1, x2 in this state. Um, and so uh, what we're going to do <coughs> is we're going to do that same integral. But when we do it, we can see that it, what this is going to do, it's going to give us basically um, psi a x psi a um, x1. I'm just trying to do it shorthand uh, times psi, psi b uh, x2 star psi b dx2. And when you do that, you see that this is going to then lead to the expectation, expectation value of x in state A times the expectation value of x in state B. Okay, and you'll see that if you just do the, the algebra. Okay, so then the bottom line is that we see that the distance, <clears throat> the expectation value of the distance between the two particles squared, that distance squared, is equal to uh, x squared a, the expectation value of x squared for state A, plus the expectation value of x squared for state B, um, minus 2 times xA uh, xB. And so this is what we get for distinguishable particles. Distinguishable particles living in those two states. All right, the first case. Now let's do the second case, which is when we have indistinguishable fermions, indistinguishable fermions. And so we have this different many body wave function. And so now we have psi of x1, x2 uh, is equal to one over square root of two, psi a of x1, psi b of x2 minus psi a of x2, psi b of x1. Uh, okay, and so that's our wave function now. And so now let's just do the same exact thing. So we're going to let's calculate the same thing. So we're going to calculate these these three terms. Um, <clears throat> and so let's calculate the expectation value of x1 squared for this for this wave function. And as you can see, it's quite tedious. It's really a big pain in the ass because I have all these terms. But it's easy. It's it's just easy, okay? You just it's basically just the integral of psi star x1 squared psi. That's all we're doing. But now um, I have these gigantic psi's with all these terms, so that the algebra is quite tedious. I'll just write out the first term. That is an integral over. I'm going to have now an integral over um, <clears throat> uh, dx1 and dx2, and now I'm going to have psi star is going to be psi star a of x1, psi star b of x2, minus psi uh, star a of x2, psi star b of x1, and then I got to do x1 squared, and then I got to do it all over again, psi, but now without the star, psi a of x1, psi x2, minus psi a of x2, B of x1. So you can see it's tedious, but it's easy. All right, it's easy. You can fill your pages with algebra, and then you can do some algebra on that. And I'm not going to go through the algebra because it's just like before. And this is basically what we'll get. We'll get x1 squared when you when you regroup those terms and do those integrals, which is not hard. You see that the expectation value of x1 squared is equal to <clears throat> one half times 
the expectation value of x squared in state A plus the expectation value of x squared in state B. And this answer is actually intuitive. I mean, it, you look at it, you just see a bunch of equations, but it, it's actually telling you something kind of simple. The simple thing is that, is that look, particle one right here, see up here, uh, up here you can see where I'm going, that's where I am. Right here, particle one is in state A, but here, particle one is in state B. So in my wave function, particle one is sometimes, half the time is in state A, and half the time is in state B. So the expectation value of where he is, it can be half of where you would expect for state A and half of where you expect for state B. So it's actually a very intuitive uh, result, um, uh, if you think about it. Uh, okay, and so now let's calculate then the same thing for particle two. And you can guess the answer because, well, can someone guess the answer? What, what's the expectation value of the, of the location of particle two squared? Can someone just do all the algebra in your head, do all the integrals and just tell me the answer? Does anybody know the answer? Just shout it out if you do. The same. Yes, exactly the same. Because I got the same deal for particle two. He's half the time in state B and half the time in state A. You can just see it in the wave function. So we got the same thing. X squared A plus X squared B. <coughs> okay, but now we've got to do the harder one. Well, it's not that hard, but now we've got to do the weird term, this X1 times X2. And we've got to calculate the expectation value of this quantity for the wave function. So now I've got to do the same thing. So it's going to be one half. Got to integrate dx1, dx2. Now I got to do my, my many body wave function, star of x1, x2, of x1, x2. I got to do all that algebra. And you know I'm not going to do it. It's too much tedious work. But, um, but it's worth doing. So you do it. So to go home, do the algebra, or it's in the book also, but do the algebra. And when you do the algebra, you're going to get this answer. <clears throat> and the answer you're going to get is this. You're going to find that the expectation value of x1 times x2 for this uh, anti-symmetrized uh, wave function is going to be x, the expectation value of x for state A times expectation value of state x for state B, which is the same as what we got before. Remember up here for the distinguishable particle, I'll remind you, we got that same answer. But now there's going to be a new term due to the fact that I have a symmetrized wave function. And the new term is this, minus uh, the expectation value of state x, uh, and I'm going to put subscript ab, quantity squared. <clears throat> and so this is what we get. This is the answer. And what the heck is this weird term? And this weird term is this. This weird term here, expectation of state, uh, expectation value of the operator x, but now for state a, b, is this. I have my integral of, uh, now I have the integral over x of psi a star of x times x times psi b of x. Now, uh, this is something that I'm trying to think, have you seen this before? I'm not sure if you saw this before last semester. You've probably not seen this before. The, the, what we call, this, this is not an expectation value. It's not an expectation value. Because if it was an expectation value, I would need these two states to be the same, right? So this is not an expectation value. Um, what we call it, the, it, you can call it different things. You can call it the exchange term, but really what, what it really is called uh, is an overlap integral, overlap integral. This is what most people call it. It's an overlap integral because you can see that it depends on the overlap of those two wave functions. Because look, check it out. Uh, if I have, if this is a x and this is psi, Suppose that this was state 
A and this was state B. Then do that integral, psi B. Now do the integral and then what is the integral? Somebody tell me X, A, B, do the integral in your head. Somebody tell me what's the answer? Zero. Exactly, it's zero because what you see that uh, that state A and state B are, are, are they never have non-zero values at, at the same time. And so for this integral, for this integral to be non-zero, I need, I need state, I need state A and state B to have some non-zero value at the same time. So to have a non-zero value of that, I have to have this. See, I gotta have psi A and psi B. And so now I can have this does not equal zero. Okay, so um, uh, and so this is overlap. So this integral gives you a sense of, 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 of how much the wave functions overlap. And so what we see then is that um, uh, what we see then from this integral, we see something really weird. We see um, that, uh, let me get this straight. Okay, that actually, okay, so this is what we see. So let's, let's write everything down. Let's, let's do the whole thing. Um, if I do this, if I calculate now the difference, the distance squared between particle one and particle two for my anti-symmetric many body wave function, then the full answer, after we write it all down, is this. I get x squared, the expectation value of the x squared operator for state A, plus the expectation value of the x squared operator for state B, minus two times the expectation value of x for state A, times the expectation value of x for state B, which I might add is the same answer that you got for the distinguishable particles, distinguishable particle answer. But now we have this other part, which comes from that weird overlap term, plus two times the absolute magnitude squared of this new term, the, the overlap integral, uh, x a, a b squared. Now, what I want you to see first, um, what is the sign of this new term? Is it positive, negative, or, or changes? Would somebody tell me the answer? Positive. It? Yeah, it's always positive. Always greater than zero. It's always positive. And so what does that tell me about the distance between the particles. So if I have two distinguishable particles, I get some wave, I can find the, the distance between them. But now I have two indistinguishable fermions and I count, and for the same two states, state A and B, they put them in the box. Remember the two, the two particles are, I have, remember the whole point, I have my box, I have state A, I have state B, I have one particle there and I have one particle there. And now, I'm, and now I measure, the, I do the experiment, I measure the distance between them a gazillion times, I average it for the indistinguishable fermions and I get a different answer. I see that the two particles are on average a, dis, a different distance apart than they would have been for the distinguishable particles. Is that distance closer or further apart? Somebody tell me. Further apart? Yes. It's further apart because this is positive. See, that means that the two particles are further apart on average. Two particles further apart. Oh my God, that's so amazing because they're acting as though they repel. They're acting like they repel each other, but there is no interaction between them. So this is an effective repulsion that occurs simply due to the symmetrization of the many body wave function. So that's pretty cool. That's kind of an amazing thing. I think that's really neat. Um, so they they repel, but they're not really repelling in the in the classical sense. There is no interaction. They're repelling purely due to the symmetrization of the wave function. And so some people call this. So out in the real world, this this actually happens, and some people even have a name for this. Some people will call this. Uh, 
Pauli repulsion. Pauli repulsion. It's the idea that the Pauli exclusion principle causes particles to sort of push apart. And, and you can see that this effect only really matters when there's overlap. Uh, big when big overlap. Because you can see that if the two particles are in states where they're far apart already, then, then this Pauli repulsion doesn't really have much of an effect. But if the wave functions are overlapping, then you can see that there's a sort of pushing apart. The, the, it's like the wave, this two, the particles are in these two wave functions that overlap and they want to sort of push apart. Uh, and that's Pauli repulsion. Um, and uh, and that's, that's kind of a cool thing. Um, and, and you can just see it in the wave function. I'll just, I'll just point it out to you. Like right now, let's just write out the wave function. Psi is equal to one over square root of two. I just want you to see something. This helps me actually. You can just see it when you look at the wave function. Uh, can be like the quick and dirty way to see this effect is just, just at, let's just ask the question, can the two particles ever be on top of each other? If the, for the particles to be on top of each other on top, then that means that x1 equals x2, right? That's what it means for two particles to be on top of each other, to physically be at the same location. I have an anti-symmetric wave function of two fermions. Can the two fermions ever be at the same location in space? Somebody tell me, yes or no. Can they? Yes or no? Say it. No. No. Why not? Why not? It if I have zero. Exactly, because if I if I input psi x1 and psi x2, and if I make x2 equal to x1 and I calculate this, you can see that these two, two terms cancel and it goes to zero. If the wave function is zero, that means that that, that that thing never happens. If the wave function is zero, it doesn't happen. So that means particles can never be on top of each other. But let's do, but if I did bosons, then I would put, for bosons, I'd make that plus. Now, can the particles be on top of each other? Yes or no? Yes. That's right. So I just want you to see the difference, okay? So, but I did this, I, I don't wanna mess this up. Let's just keep it here like that. Okay, so I just, so that's the quick and dirty way to see it, you know, like you just write down the wave function, you can see the particles never are on top of each other for fermions, but they can be on top of each other for bosons. And that's an effect, and that's gonna, and that sort of helps you to remember that the, the fermions push apart and the bosons pull together. But let's continue and let's let's do the math and let's just let's look, let's do the third case. The third case now. Let's ask ourselves. So now I have a particle in state A, and I put a particle in state B. That's my that's my physical situation. But now the two particles are bosons. And now the question I want to ask is, what is the distance between the two particles? or what is the average of the distance squared, okay? That's what I wanna ask. And so now we have, of course, the many body wave function is now gonna be one over square root of two times psi A of X1, psi B of X2, plus psi A of X2, psi B of X1. Okay, so um, now let's do all that math all over again. And you know I'm not gonna do it, I'll just write out the answer, but let's do all, let's calculate then the expectation value of x1 minus x2, and let's do all those integrals. They're not hard, but they're tedious. <clears throat> and when you do it, this is what you find. You find that the, extra, that the distance between them, the average distance between them squared is gonna be the expectation value of x squared for, part of, for state A, plus the expectation value of uh, x squared for state B, uh, minus twice the expectation value for A, expectation value for X for B. And once again, I'll just remind you that this is the, the, the answer for, for the distinguishable case. Same thing that we got for the distinguishable case. But now we're gonna have a minus times two times the uh, absolute magnitude of the overlap integral um, squared. Okay, so um, now we see that we have uh, an attractive 
force, and I put it in quotes because there's not really a force, but it looks as though <clears throat> the particles are attracted to each other because now the distance between them is smaller. Is less than for distinguishable case. Oh, distance, oh, distinguishable case. Sorry for my messy writing. But the distance, oh, it's just really sad, so terrible. I can't stand looking at it. Um, the distance between the two particles is less than for the distinguishable case. So the particles attract. And so this leads to, so bosons behave as though they are attracting each other. Bosons attract each other. And this leads, of course, to Bose-Einstein condensation. Bose-Einstein condensation. Uh, but I'm not going to get into that, uh, but I just will mention it to you. Okay, but I did tell you that, that but remember I, I said that for the fermions, this leads to magnetism. And so I want to, I'm a solid state physics guy. And so in my world, magnetism is very important. And so, uh, and so I want to say a word about that. Um, <clears throat> why would this lead to magnetism? Um, okay, and it's not completely obvious, but it's actually very simple. So to understand this, what we got to do is magnetism to do talk about magnetism magnetism is all about spin and it's very important because magnets are important because without magnets uh you wouldn't be able to stick things on your refrigerator and you wouldn't be able to put a note there saying hey don't drink my beer asshole or stuff like that so magnetism is incredibly important um so we can stick things onto the refrigerator with magnets and so we want, we want to understand the quantum mechanics of this and why it occurs. Um, and so um, what we can do then is <clears throat> if, if we have a, so if we have a bunch of particles and we throw them into a box and we have these states, A, B, C, we throw them into the box. Now these particles have spin. They have spin and I'll draw the spin as little arrows. And we can ask ourselves, um, what then is the wave function? What is my many body wave function? And okay, so I'm gonna I'm just gonna do this. This is uh, this discussion is to motivate addition of spin. That's what, that is our next top topic, addition of spin. That is the next topic of this course but I want to motivate it with this discussion of magnetism. So I put a bunch of particles in this box and I ask you, what is the many body wave function? Let's just do two, all right? Because uh, we were just doing two. So let's do, let's erase the third guy. So, because it, it, we can figure it out for two particles and that's the same as a thousand, okay? And it's pretty much the same. So let's figure it out for two particles. So I put two particles in the box, two electrons, okay, in my box. And I, and I ask you, I say, okay, tell me, what's the many body wave function? Well, we just figured it all out. We just had this big long discussion about symmetrized wave functions. And so I say what it is and then you think to yourself, okay, well, are the particles distinguishable? And the answer is yes. Okay, so that means you got to do the symmetrization trick. Got to symmetrize. And then you, you ask the next question, are they fermions or bosons? And then you say, well, they're electrons. So they're spin one half, they're fermions. So then you know they got to, that the wave function has to be anti-symmetric, right? A, S meaning that under particle exchange the wave function has to be equal to what somebody tell me negative so exactly right okay so that's all the stuff we've been talking about all right but now i have but now you realize that i have i have a spatial part 
of my wave function, which is a function of position one and position two, but I also have a spin part of my wave function, which is uh, a function of um, the whether I have the spins are up or down. Okay, so you see that I have a I, I have a spin part of my wave function and a spatial part. Now we just had a long discussion about wave functions just a moment ago, and that was a discussion about the spatial part. And we know then that the spatial part to be symmetrized, I can either do psi a, psi b, plus or minus psi a, psi b. Okay, that trick, you know, we just did it. I'm just trying to do it in shorthand. Um, so we have two possibilities. If there's a plus, then I see that this wave function is symmetric under particle exchange. If there's a minus, then I see it's anti-symmetric under particle exchange. Okay, so we, we know how to deal with the spatial part. We just had this long discussion about it. So we know how to construct symmetry spatial wave functions for two particles. But what about the spin? We haven't talked about spin. So there's some, I'll do it like this. I'll call it the spin wave function. What the heck is the spin wave function? <clears throat> well, we know that it's going to have it's going to have some it's going to have a bunch of spin in it, and we're and what we're going to do in the next few minutes or whatever we're going to actually construct the spin wave function. But you know what? I don't want to even construct it now. I just want to have a very general discussion. We will construct it. We will construct it. But let's just have a general discussion because I need, if I have a spin wave function and a spatial wave function, then I can say, what is the total many body wave function of my system? If I knew the spatial wave function and I knew the spin wave function, then I'm asking you, what is the many body wave function? Somebody tell me. In terms of these two objects, these two functions, what is the many body wave function? I'm asking you a question. Just multiply them together. Yeah, it's just the product, right? Because it's this and that. I have space and I have spin. And whenever you have two things at the same time, probabilistically, you just multiply them. So the total wave function is just going to be the spatial part times the spin part. Okay, and so this is a totally general argument. And so now what we can do is there's, there's different ways of separating them. I mean, there's all this complication stuff, but let's just keep it really simple. Let's just assume I have a spatial part times a spin part. And now I can start asking you, I, now let's start hitting this with a part of the exchange, P12, sign many body. Now, if I, if I hit, If I, if I hit this, my, my many body state with my particle exchange operator, you know that you can construct two uh, possible, you know how to construct symmetrized spatial wave functions and you know how to make it so that this is plus by putting the plus sign there, right? This guy, but you could also make it so that the symmetrization is minus by putting the minus sign there. And if I, use, if I put the plus sign, then when I hit that guy, P12, it'll be the plus. And if I put the minus sign, then when I hit P12, it's going to be the minus. So you know how to do that. So suppose I have my two electrons in the box. Remember what we're even talking about. I've got two electrons, side A, side B. And now suppose the spatial part was plus. What would be the spin part? Somebody tell me, what would be the symmetry of the spin part of the wave function under particle exchange? What does it have to be? Anti-symmetric. Anti yeah, exactly. It would have to be negative because that way when I hit it with the P12, this guy is plus and this guy is negative and plus times negative equals negative. On the other hand, what if I had chosen instead to have the spatial wave function anti-symmetric, what would the spin part have to be? Symmetric. Yes, it would have to be plus. 
because then when I did the particle exchange, minus times plus is minus. Because remember, a many body wave function for fermions has to be anti-symmetric. That's the rule that we learned from quantum field theory that I mentioned last time. It's an unbreakable rule. A system of indistinguishable fermions, the many body wave function always is anti-symmetric under particle exchange. And so this is how we construct it. So now you can see that in a real system, the spatial part of the of the uh, fermionic wave function might be some might be anti-symmetric, but it also might be symmetric if we include spin. You see, both possibilities are there. We have the spatial because before I was saying, well, the fermions has to be anti-symmetric spatial part, but that's not quite true because if I have spin, the anti the, the negative sign could be carried by the spin part. So I could actually have a symmetric spatial part of my wave function times an anti-symmetric spin part. Or I could have an anti-symmetric spatial part times a symmetric spin part. So now I'm going to ask you a question. I'm going to call these two cases, case one and case two. Now comes my question. Which of these two cases does nature choose? Case one or case two and why? Somebody tell me. And if you already know the answer from like some class, if you're a graduate student and you've already learned this, you know, that's no fair. I want someone who's never thought of this before to, to answer my question. Which one does nature choose, case one or case two, and why? For electrons, I'm talking about two electrons. Somebody tell me. We're, we're deriving magnetism. We're deriving the phenomena of magnetism. This is why things stick to your refrigerator. Um, professor, I mean, before anyone answers, I, I, I want to ask what it means to say which one does nature choose? Because if all we can measure is the, uh, like the square of the wave function, then how do you even tell the difference? <clears throat> well, um, Often in physics, we have multiple possibilities. That a, a, I have a system, and the system can be in many different states. And we often use this language. We say, we often ask the question, which state does nature choose? And that's like a common question that we use in physics. And so I'm using it now, and I'm not using, and I'm using it in this sort of the standard way. And so I want someone to, to, that's a good question. You're asking a good question. What does it even mean to say that nature chooses one situation or the other? And so I'm asking, so somebody tell me, why would nature choose, wh what am I even talking about? Why would nature choose one situation over the other? Somebody tell me why. Without even answering this question, just as a general philosophical question, why would nature choose one situation over the other? Why? Somebody tell me. Uh, nature prefers the state with the lowest energy. Yes. Boom. That's the answer. Yes. Perfect. That's exactly right. So when I say which one does nature choose, nature, uh, nature is lazy. Nature is lazy. We're all lazy. Nature wants to choose the lowest energy Every, because everything just falls to the lowest energy. Uh, and how it falls to the lowest energy, of course, you know, people spend their lifetimes trying to figure that out, you know but nature likes to fall to the lowest energy. So when I say, which state does nature choose? Really what I'm implicitly saying is, which state has the lowest energy? So thank you for that clarification. Okay, but now we're back to the question. I have state one and state two, these two situations. Which one does nature choose? Somebody tell me. Is it state two? Because uh, the fermions wanna be like farther apart and the anti-symmetric wave function is farther apart? That is the correct answer. But why do they want to be farther apart? Why would, why would, that, why would nature choose that? The exchange force? There is no exchange force. It's just a figment of your imagination. I mean, there is no force. There is no force, but it's not the exchange force. But, well, tell me, why, why would the... Uh, this is a trick question. But I have electrons, two electrons. Why would nature choose the the spatial part to be anti-symmetric? Does it have something to do with the ground state? Because what? Does it have something to do with the ground state being anti-symmetric? 
Well, I mean, the many body wave function is always anti-symmetric, whether it's the ground state or the excited state, you know, it's always anti-symmetric. So that's not exactly the right answer, but why would nature choose the situation where the two electrons are further apart? <clears throat> and it is, a it's, trick, just, it's a trick question. Is it just a Coulomb repulsion? Yes, that's exactly right. That's why it's a trick question, because suddenly you have to think about the interactions. Because all this discussion so far, we've been talking about non-interacting particles. But in reality, they are interacting. They're always, they're often interacting. Electrons interact like crazy. They have Coulomb repulsion. They're, they have light charge, so they repel. So that means that the lower energy, well, I'll ask you, are two electrons in a lower energy state when they are closer or farther? Which one? Tell me. Farther? Yeah. Right, and you learn that in electricity and magnetism because the you know the the, potent, the energy of two like charges goes down as one over r as you go farther apart. Yes, and so they the, so if the two electrons are farther apart, it's a lower energy state, and so that's why nature chooses case uh, two, this one. I'll circle it. Nature prefers this, so nature picks this one. Nature likes this one more because it's lower energy, lower energy. But what does that mean? Okay, so that means that the spatial part is anti-symmetric, but that means that the spin part is symmetric. Now, how do you get a symmetric spin state? Well, symmetric, and I'll just tell you the answer real quick, is like if I have two particles, if both particles are both in the same spin state, it's symmetric because I have particle one and I have particle two. And if they're both in the same spin state, um, I'll call that uh, S1, M, S1 times S2, M, S2. If they're both in the same spin state, let's say they're both spin up, that means that that is a symmetric because you see that if I exchange the two particles, then it's the same. If this guy's up and this guy's up, but now I exchange the labels, <laughs> Now this guy's up and this guy's still up. You see the spins are all in the same direction. And so that is a symmetric spin state. <clears throat> but what does it mean when the spin, if I have a system like an atom full of electrons or a bunch of electrons and a chunk of iron or cobalt, and if all the electrons have their spin pointing in the same direction, what do we call that object? We say that that object is what? What's the word we use to describe that situation when all the spins are pointing in the same direction? We say that object is what? Magnetized? Yeah, we say it's magnetic. That is magnetism. That, that's it. That is the origin of magnetism. We just derive magnetism because all the spins want to point in the same direction because it lowers the Coulomb energy. So it's the Coulomb repulsion between the electrons that makes the spins want to align. That's a really weird thing. I mean, it's really kind of cool and weird. You know, the repulsion, why would repulsion between electrons make spins align? Well, we just derived it. Because repulsion between electrons makes the spatial part of the wave function want to be anti-symmetric, thus causing the spin part to be symmetric. And if the spin part is symmetric, this part of the spins are aligned and it's magnetic. So it's the Coulomb repulsion between electrons that, that causes magnetism. So I think that's really cool. And it all comes from all the symmetrization stuff. And, and this is happening in, in atoms and it's happening in a chunk of cobalt that sticks to your refrigerator. Um, and, and this process that the spins like to align in the ground state, spins align in the ground state, this leads to magnetism. And we have a name for this, we call it, this thing that we just derived, we call it Hun's rule. Hun's rule. And Hun's rule is basically saying that in, in, many, many, in many particle systems, many electron systems, the ground state typically has all the spins aligned. And the point of Hun's rule is just that it, it, it minimizes uh, Coulomb energy. Okay, so uh, that's sort of, you know, further than the topic of this course, but I just think that's a really cute and very <coughs> cool thing uh, that happens. Um, so we just have a few more minutes because we end at 12. And so what I'm going to do <clears throat> is, um, okay, so, so I, I've been talking about this many body spin state. So I say that 
let's say I have two electrons. And so we see that the many body wave function of two electrons is equal to, I got a spatial part times, and I'll write it like this, a spin part. And so we talked a lot about the spatial part, but now let's talk about the spin part. Okay, let's, let's derive this. Okay, let's derive the spin part of the wave function for a many body system. So I'll say here, many body. Let's derive the many body spin wave function. Um, and so it's actually a pretty simple thing to do because let's say they have two particles, then, you know, before, when I talk about the spatial part, space, spatial part, I, I had a box. And you picture in your mind a box. I have state A, state B, <clears throat> state C. And I could throw the particles into this box into different states. But, but now for spin, then I, do, I, I don't have a box anymore. Space, there is no space. Spin doesn't care about space. It's, space has no meaning to spin. But, the, but, but I see that for an electron uh, of spin one half, and let's just deal with spin one half for now. If spin one half, then, then my states are up and down, okay? And, and if I had, um, and I should just say, if I had S equals one, then what would my states be? How many states would I have for S equals one? Three. That's right, I would have up, down, and zero spin zero <clears throat> because these are the uh these are the z components we talk about we say up down but what we're talking about is the z component of the spin so from that little so i gave that lightning quick spin tutorial or spin review at the very first lecture just to remind you guys all the properties of spin and i'm assuming that you guys know all the properties of spin so i hope you do and if you don't if you're in this class and <clears throat> you haven't learned spin, then go learn it. <laughs> Please go learn it. Go. It's not that hard because it's just it's just recapitulating uh, orbital angular momentum. It's just a recapitulation of orbital angular momentum, but just uh, without the spatial part. Um, okay. So so if I have spin, then you see. Let's if I have spin equals uh, one half, then we see that there's only two states allowed. Two states. And those two states are going to be, uh, I can call it, you know, well, we like to use the term up. And that's going to be um, uh, S uh, and then M sub S. Okay, so I have the total spin. That's my S total, or I'm sorry, that's my. Um, I'm gonna have my S squared eigenvalue and I'm gonna have my S is Z eigenvalue. And so if I have um, so if I have two particles, then for particle one, I can have um, for particle one, my spin state, I can write it as S1, M sub S1. And for particle two, I can say my state is S2, M sub S2. Okay, so those are the spin, those are the spin, so those are like the two different possible states that two particles can have. And so one way of writing my spin wave function is just to take those two states for the two different particles and to do what with them? <clears throat> product. Exactly, product. I just multiply them together. And so this is my, so this is my total spin wave function. I just take the spin of state of particle one and the spin state of particle two, and I multiply them. And that's a product state. That's the simplest thing I can do. And it's easy. So that's, 
There's nothing more than that. <clears throat> but then it turns out that it's convenient for us to choose a different basis. So this is the product basis. And we can look at all the different possible product states. I could have up, up. How many product states are there for two spins, for two particles with spin? Well, one particle can be in two states, the other particle can be in two states, so it's two times two is four. So I can have up, down, I can have up, up, or up, down, or I can have down, up, or I can have down, down. So there's four states. So those are my four possible product states. And so that is a complete basis. And this is the last thing I'll say before stopping, because we're going a minute over. Uh, this is a complete basis, but Sometimes it's useful to change the basis. And the change of basis is to talk about total spin angular momentum. So total, we're going to talk about the total spin, and that is a change of basis. So we're going to, the product basis is the simplest basis, but we're going to do a change of basis into the total spin basis. So that, that's what we'll do next time. Okay, folks. Bye-bye. 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 Thank, Thank you so much. All right. Bye. <clears throat>